last December, hundreds of scientists met in Montreal and read their papers to each other. Naturally, the entire world printed what they had to say. Fortunately for me, the Los Angeles Times carried it daily. I must confess, everyone really fired me. But one in particular interested me. And this scientist read a paper on the sperm. He said the sperm remains as much a mystery today as it was when man first became curious about its nature. And then he made this little statement. The sperm somehow easily passes through the surface of an egg. Although the outside of the egg has no holes in it, either before or after fertilization. Well, that fired me. On the morning of the 19th of February, I was lying in bed quite early, thinking of this strange mystery of the sperm and wondering all about it. And suddenly I felt myself detached from this body. I was not in my room, but I was in a room, and the room was sealed. There was no entrance, no exit, just a sealed room. But as I entered it, it became alive, it became animated. Then I thought of my bed, my body, and in one moment I am back on my bed. I thought of another detachment. I'm in an entirely different room, but it's also sealed. How I got in, I do not know other than I simply imagine myself away from my body. I did not single out the room. The room was completely sealed. No entrance, no exit. Then I thought, here are these unnumbered states of consciousness. You can't number them. You can liken each state to an egg. And every state remains just like the egg until fertilized. And the presence that fertilizes the egg is simply our consciousness. We must be in it to activate it, to animate it. You could this very moment single out any state and by the use of your imagination imagine that you're in it you'd be in it think this very moment of your living room or any room in your house take an object a familiar object in your room and bring it as close as you can if it's really here well then you can't be here in this room as you become intense about it concentrated on it you are really where you are imagining yourself to be. For man being all imagination, he must be where he is in imagination. But what have I done then? I've fertilized it. I've actually made it real. And in a way that I do not know, I am going to go there. But now you will say, naturally, I'm going to go there today. It's my home. I use that only to illustrate a point. You could take any place no matter where it is, any part of the world, if you did the same thing to it that you would now do to your home, you will find yourself compelled to move across a bridge of incident leading up to the fulfillment of that state. You don't devise the means, but there's so many little facets to this wonderful art of imagining. I'll tell you one to show you the danger. When one wants one thing, above all things in this world, and they're willing to sacrifice their moral, ethical code, in fact, every code. It also works. That's why I warned you in my last book, I can only acquaint you with the law and leave you to your choice and its risk, and I mean risk. I call this lady a friend, she is a friend, I'm not here to judge anyone in the world. And she is my friend living in New York City. 
When she was a young girl, she was as poor as a church mouse. She had nothing. Her only claim to recognition was the fact she descended physically from the Adamses, our presidents. And she was very proud of that fact, very proud. But she had no money. The one thing she wanted above everything in this world was money. And I don't mean a few hundred thousand dollars. I mean money in the true sense of the word. To the disgust of her parents, she used to always pretend she had fabulous fortunes. She is not, may I say, a good-looking lady, either in form or in feature. Nice in many other respects, but you could never accuse her of being a beautiful woman. But nevertheless, she dreamed this state, and she just simply wanted money. At a party one day, she met a young man, just a few years her senior. He had money, multiple millions. She had nothing. She had a physical line leading to the Adamses. He had oodles of money. His line led to one of the bishops of New York State. I do not say this to, in any way, discourage you in your admiration of some bishop or some man of the cloth. But his grandfather was a bishop in New York State. He knew all the lovely parcels of, well, real estate. Where tomorrow, if he could hold on to it, what it would be worth. And so here's a bishop of the church. Instead of taking care of his flock, he was taking care of his pocket. And he left millions to this man's father, who in turn left it to him. My friend only wanted money. And so in no time flat, they got married. And they lived for 21 years in intimate hostility. Really. Solid beyond measure. I wouldn't dare discuss it from the platform. So at the end of these 21 years, they called the day and divided the millions. She still wanted more millions. She could open Tiffany with her diamonds and her jewelry. Still wanted more. She had a little cousin who always worked for a salary. But he got in on the ground floor when our huge big corporations of the day were being organized. Saved his money, he was a bachelor, he lived alone, very frugal, and he bought a little bit of this stock, a little bit of that, never touched it. It split and split and split and split. Year before last, he had the presence of mind to die. <laughs> the only member of his family that would ever see him was this lady. She knew, in some strange way, he had money. She would bring him home for an occasional dinner, would call him on the phone. So when they found his will, she was the only member of the family named in the will. He has other first cousins, but they were above it all. They came from the Adamses, and he must be on the outside or something. But he was not what they would cultivate. When the will was read, my friend and my friend alone got it. The last estimate, they're still finding it. He put it in this bank, in that box, in the other box, well over a million. The stocks and bonds are worth, and she got it all. Now her cousins aren't speaking to her, because she got it. The price she paid for money I hope that no one here would be willing to pay. She could have had all the millions she now has, plus happiness. She could have, if she only knew the law. You want it, but you condition it. You want it with dignity. That statement of Milliken. I have a lavish, steady, 
dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit. That's our great Millikan. He was a poor boy too, and he grew tired of his poverty. And the story is told me by the one who interviewed him after he got the prize, the Nobel Prize, in this cosmic ray studies. And he said to her, the interviewer, I was a poor boy, raised in a nice environment. My father was a traveling minister. He had no money, but he gave us good books. We were always playing games, he, a strong body and a strong mind. But he had a code, a decent code. And so I wanted money, but I wanted it in this manner. So I locked myself in a room one day. I did not have even a glass of water for 16 hours. And in that interval, I repeated over and over and over to myself this thought that I wrote out. I have, in the present tense, I have a lavish, steady, dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit. Well, he certainly earned it. He had all these things when he died. He had the respect of the world. He gave to the world as much or more than they gave to him. Yes, he had millions. But look what he gave to the world. That's how he wanted it. My friend could have done something similar, but no, she wanted money. And she was willing to pay the price, any price, and how she has paid it. So I warn you, yes, you want something, and the thing that will fertilize it is your own wonderful human imagination. But you know exactly what you want, occupy it. I find one of the great fallacies of the world is perpetual construction, deferred occupancy. We know what we want, but we leave it out there and hope that the passing of time will make it. They won't do it. I have to occupy it and make there here. I make then, now, and dwell in it just as though it were true. And if I dwell in it just as though it's true, though one second later, the phone rings and breaks the spell, or someone calls me, or I wake from it, I have fertilized it. You go into the state and you fertilize it. I may not recognize my harvest when it comes in due season. It'll come may not come tonight, may not come tomorrow, but it will come because I fertilized it. I went into a state, occupied it, and the whole thing becomes fertilized. But every egg has its own appointed hour, and it ripens and it will flower. If to me it seemed long, then I must wait, for it is sure, and it will not be late. These infinite states of the world are waiting for occupancy, waiting to be fertilized by us. That's why we must become so extremely discriminating. Know what you want and do make it conform to your code of decency, your wonderful ethical code. You don't have to in any way tarnish that code. You don't to get what you want in this world. But men are not aware of that. And they're quite willing to tarnish it a bit to get what they really want in this world.